Persona 5 Royal is a game about dating hot Japanese teenagers and has nothing to do with societal hierarchies, the freedom of choice, or facing traumatic events. There's also some combat involved in it. And in this combat system, there's a select few personas who can quite literally break the game. Yoshitsune, Kaguya, Will, My Dad, an expired box of thin mints. One are more powerful than the creator himself, Izanagi no Okami Pikoro. Persona 5 Royal is longer than the original Naruto series on average, so today I'd like to find out how fast I can beat it if I were to use the most broken character in a video game since Silver the Hedgehog. It's no use! Take this! It's no use! This will end it! Today we find out. How fast can you beat Persona 5 Royal using Izanagi no Okami Pigoro? Now first I should clear the air. I am not a speedrunner. There are a select group of elites that actually speedrun this godforsaken game, and I will be linking their runs and channels in the description. It's actually incredible the things they're capable of, and it's worth watching. With that out of the way, let's get into me making up the plot of this game for the sixth different time. The game begins with a bunch of bullshit that I don't have time to explain, but I promise we'll come back to it later, because this is a setup for a flashback anyway. I name myself the fastest thing I could think of, and tell Sai about how I smoked everything in this game for just $5.99. Flashback to April, and I hop off the train, a horny teen in a new city where just under 50% of the people I can talk to want to have sex with me. I head to my new home and meet my guy Double S, and get enrolled at the Youth Academy for absentee parents. The next day, Ryuji helps me perform a skip called Schoolless, where we avoid the first day of school and instead go straight into Kamoshida's palace, saving about 5 minutes and giving me a gold for this split. We also rescue Morgana, skipping all the BS cutscenes that turn this tutorial section into a Dragon Ball Z filler episode. I'm not allowed to get the Doombringer until a few days into Kamoshida's palace, so these first fights will have to be fought with our sin or as I like to call him, Izanagi no reason to keep him as my persona. The boys escape the palace, and in the real world, Kamoshida gives us more sass than a K-pop stan when you don't watch their fan cam. The gang learns that Kamoshida is just being a racist away from a society bingo of no-nos, so they decide that he's gotta eat more dirt than Shiho did. Hey, you know what we gotta do to cuz? You know what we gotta do to you. We gotta kill him! Avril Lavigne and Skater Boy get their personas, and it is here that I'm finally able to summon the equivalent of a Grand Theft Auto cheat code. At this point you might be asking yourself, well I get it, Izanagi no Okami Pikoro is one of the highest level personas in the game, but what makes him the strongest? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. That truths is a move so devastating that I genuinely wonder why it's in the game. The move is equivalent to having 3 Megidolons dropped on your dome for just 40 SP. At his strongest, I've seen videos of Inopikuro damn near one shot every single enemy in this game. To call it broken would be like calling Lebron James a basketball player or calling Ludwig a bit of a scammer. With myriad truths in my pocket, the game is over. No, seriously. There will be nothing even remotely hurting me from this point on, so get ready, because shit is about to move at the speed of Among Us uploads. Kamoshida's palace gets run through like the only girl at a heterosexual orgy, with the only hiccups being the amount of time it takes to backtrack through the palace for the bridge keys. Because I have a persona with a level higher than what I normally beat the game at, I don't need to grind at all, and can simply run past every single enemy in the game to get done faster. I reach the treasure, send the calling card, and it's time to fa- oh shit he's already dead? Damn, I took too long to explain, um, he here watch an ad while I get caught up to the story. Hey everyone, Editor Tevin here. Uh, did you know that people that aren't subscribed to me aren't subscribed to me? <laughs> I know, it's crazy right? Well if you're liking the video, consider leaving a like. And if you like my content, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss a video. Also, a big shout out to these Patreon supporters. If you want to help me and see these videos more frequently, please consider supporting me there. 
Thank you. In the meantime, I train at home, train with Ryuji, train at the gym, and eat like Goku for recovery. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yes, sir, brother. <laughs> I also head to Mementos for the first time and meet Jose, the child I will never speak to again after this moment. The next day, a new counselor shows up to school on Friday the 13th, which is nothing but a pure coincidence. Afterwards, the gang goes to see their friend, asexual Jun Kurosu, to see about making them a painting, when we realize that his dad is acting a little suspicious. We find out that Madarame has a palace, and it's discovered within that he's not Yusuke's dad at all, but rather a fucking murdering thief that looks like he should be the main villain to the epic Mickey series. But when we try to tell Yusuke, he turns into Van Gogh and refuses to hear us out. After running through the palace like an anime fan runs from any woman who isn't pixelated, I reach a roadblock where the only way to move forward is to coerce my only female friend into taking an analogous nude for Yusuke. Shit goes sideways, Yusuke falls long ways, and after a brief battle with a homeless man and his flock of pigeons, Yusuke joins the team. Back in the palace, I steamroll through the entire thing, crushing enemies and jumping in the paint like your boy was Zion Williamson. I reach the treasure, send the calling card, and face off against my personal nemesis, Madarame. Unfortunately for Madarame, I brought a god to a paint fight, and I make him suffer for his art. Madarame gets murdered by some teens, and we escape the palace, needing just one more kill for our spy plane. In the meantime, I blackmail my teacher into an unsolicited relationship, study in the loudest place possible, enable my caffeine addiction, and discuss mental health with the craziest person in this game. Well, second craziest. Afterwards, I help save this girl from the Persona fandom, and we have lunch together later. But she bought a matching outfit after just meeting me, so I think she might be a little crazy. To celebrate our latest killing, the gang heads to a live studio viewing of Ellen. And after the show, guest star Akechi asks if I'd like to be friends, founding the basis of what would become some of the worst Rule 34 on the internet. The next day at school, this uptight lesbian won't leave my squad alone, and threatens to oust us as the Phantom Thieves unless we help take down the patriarchy. We oblige because we hate men too, and go after notorious celebrity meninist Kaneshiro. We try to take care of him in the real world first, but that goes about as well as Pokimane's love life. So instead, we go into his palace, and fly through it like his treasure was a date with Halsey. This is actually when the game starts getting kind of annoying. Enemies aren't dying in one shot due to my lower level, and every fight I get into takes longer due to multiple waves. I hadn't considered the fact that I could just run away, because I figured it'd be easier to just fight, but either way, this palace was kind of a bag of dicks. Still, we smack many bosses around, punch some numbers, reach the treasure, and send the calling card to the human version of Oolong. Kaneshiro's fight was very difficult. He has two different phases that require a lot of planning, and nah, come on, I just used Myriad Truths and beat him in about 5 minutes. Why did they even put this thing in the game? Kaneshiro refuses to admit there's a wage gap, so we kill him too collectively going from the Phantom Thieves to the Phantom Menace. With no new prey in sight, I receive a text while at school asking me to sort out someone named Futaba Sakura. Knowing Sojiro's last name is also Sakura, I ask him about it, only for him to give the most suspicious answer of all time. The gang learns that Futaba is his daughter, and that she called the hit on herself. Futaba's palace was actually as annoying as she is whenever I land a critical attack. I ran into enemies way too often in this palace. And even though nothing is exactly difficult in this run, being slowed down by waves of enemies while I'm trying to get a PB is certainly enough to make me consider the low tier god approach to adversity. (coughs) However, puzzles get solved, we discover that Futaba has some maternal issues, and we give her the calling card. Wakaba was probably the easiest boss outside of Kamoshida. The Ballista makes her take way more damage, which is something Izanagi no Okami Picaro definitely does not need. This fight took just 4 minutes. Wakaba dies, but rather than kill Futaba, we force her into becoming our metaverse navigator since she's more useful alive. Unfortunately however, Futaba is about as competent socially as the YouTube comment section, 
so we need to help her be a human being. One obligatory anime beach scene later, and she's good to go. And the thieves are one member stronger. One gay bath and a trip to Hawaii later, and we discover that the school principal has died, and the phantom thieves are the prime suspect. Knowing that Morgana was the only one who didn't go to Hawaii, Ryuji accuses him of killing people while we were gone and not including us in the fun, causing Morgana to dip. Realizing that Morgana might snitch, the gang decides to look for him, only for us to discover that he's been seeing a new girl, like the whore he is. Turns out that new girl is none other than Haru Okumura, daughter of a corrupt businessman. So we decide to get two for the price of one and kill him out of revenge. But it turns out that Haru hates her dad too, and that common ground brings the team back together again. Okumura's palace was surprisingly the fastest palace in the entire game. With enemies not being an issue whatsoever, the only time consuming part was... The maze. Wash, rinse, repeat, and it's time to fight Okumura. Okumura was actually somewhat interesting and not a complete blowout. The waves of executives get trashed like a frat boy during a tailgate, but the executive director could take a punch. And in Haru's case, he could give a punch too. Still, with Izanagi's level and strength and my health maxed, nothing mattered. The fight only lasted 8 minutes, or 8 times as long as me in the bedroom. Time begins flying by at this rate, because if I'm not spending my days with 15 year olds or grown men, I'm doing what every other teenager is doing in 2020, and sleeping so the day can end faster. But one day, after attempting to return Kasumi's virgin repellent charm, we discovered that we've entered the metaverse, and have entered the palace of someone we don't know yet. It turns out that Kasumi needs our help, and Morgana and I save the day. And by that, I mean I spam the same move I've been spamming all game, and Morgana sits around with his on-loving dick in his hand. We rescue Kasumi and escape, tell her the truth about the Phantom Thieves, and she actually refuses to join. I normally would have killed her then and there, but a car beat me to it a lot earlier in the game. Later that month, Akechi reveals that he knows where the Phantom Thieves, and has been posing as my friend in order to get evidence. And the only way he won't say anything is if we kill his boss, who just happens to be Makoto's sister. Sai's palace is surprisingly fast. Enemies are typically easy to avoid, many bosses die in one to two turns, and rigging the games is the only thing that takes any amount of time, due to the amount of forced cutscenes. We load the dice, rig the slots, feel our way through the dark, and one shot every single enemy in the battle arena. Add some delicious Akechi plot armor, and we make it to the treasure. Sai's fight, shocker, is the same as every other boss in the game. Beat gimmick, myriad truths go brr, and Sai ends up on Twitter for even trying to go up against the Phantom Thieves. Instead of sending Sai to hell where she'll inevitably end up, we spare her life out of love for Makoto. And Akechi, mad that we broke the agreement, somehow sends the police into the metaverse to capture me, and all that bullshit that happened at the beginning of the game comes full circle. I get arrested, and Akechi reveals that he was the one who murdered the principal, Okumura, and now... Me. Knowing that Akechi would backstab me for not killing Sai, I hired a body double to take the hit for me. I return home, and plot my revenge by going after not only Akechi, but his father Shido as well. Turns out Shido was corrupt as hell anyway, so it only made the decision easier when we pulled up in his palace. Shido's palace was an actual pain in the ass as far as speedruns go. The enemies weren't hard, and the puzzles weren't either, but the small corridors meant that I couldn't just run past enemies like usual. I lost so much time here because I continuously ran into enemy after enemy, to the point that it took me twice as long to beat this palace than any other area in the game. Still, I flew through the palace, killing shadows like ants with my Eno Picaro magnifying glass. The noble, myriad truths. The royalty, myriad truths. The TV station owner, you get the point by now. It looked like Southside Chicago in his bitch. After collecting the five letters of recommendation through sheer force, Akechi comes back, hoping to stop us from killing his daddy. Unfortunately for him, we kill two crows with one stone, as he takes more almighty to the face than Zeus's sex partners. Akechi kills Akechi before I can kill Akechi, we find the treasure, send the calling card, and get into the fight with Shido. Shido takes some time, 
with enough boss phases to make even Sephiroth proud. But just like Sephiroth, Shido can't stand up against a cute, overpowered Japanese boy, and this fight is over in record time. After killing off Shido, the Phantom Thieves expected everyone to bow down to their new teenage overlords. But instead, they start praying to some god, not knowing that anyone and anything can catch the metaphysical hands. So the thieves decide to go to the very bottom of Mementos to see who's next like Hip Hop Harry, only to find a cup. The gang tries to destroy it, but what should have been the wash of the century by the Phantom Thieves ends up as the wash of the century for the Phantom Thieves. The cup reveals that it holds the will of the people and thus cannot be defeated, as it sends us back to the real world for a few minutes before blaming our shit out of existence entirely. But that's not enough to hold a real one down, and the Phantom Thieves regroup in the Velvet Room with a renewed faith in beating the shit out of absolutely everything. Even carrying the load, the Thieves march back up to the Holy Grail, smacking everything in our way like we're on the watermelon aisle at a Walmart. And after beating the literal messengers of heaven, the only thing that stood between the Phantom Thieves and absolute dominance was a drinking utensil. The rematch against the Holy Grail can be described as- oh, it's already over, oh, okay, alright. The fight against Yaldabaoth can only be described as slightly longer than most. Yaldabaoth has a ton of health and required even more than the myriad of truths that I was constantly sending his way. Thankfully, Ryuji and Anno charge and concentrate by this point, so even if I can't one-shot the deity of homogeneity, you can rest assured that this fight took little to no effort. The God of Control can't handle the pressure of 14s and spandex and attempts to go nuclear, prompting me to summon my ace in the hole, Satanael. The tag team duo of Eno Picaro and Satanael is just way too much, and Yalabal falls, restoring the natural order. The gang plans to celebrate their overthrow of religion with an ironic Christmas party when Sai shows up to be a buzzkill once again. And just as I'm about to take one for the team, Akechi comes through taking my place in jail even after I murdered his father. After that, even weirder things began happening around the city, like Futaba winning a Christmas turkey, Ryuji bringing food to the Christmas party, and Morgana turning into a cute anime boy- wait, what the fuck? Clearly some shit has gone sideways, and only Akechi and I are aware of it. While searching for clues as to why it's opposite day, we get a call from Kasumi, saying that she has her memories as well, and that there's an unknown palace that's popped up. After digging around the palace, we discover that Maruki is the palace owner. Not only that, but Kasumi is actually Sumire, meaning that this game has officially dropped more bombs on us than a Funk Master Flex freestyle. Maruki found out that I'm the man behind the slaughter, and has changed everyone's cognition so that the murders never happen and everyone can live peacefully. Well, I hated that, and made it my sole mission to not just kill him, but to crush his dreams and his reality. After a very boring sequence of third semester content that was nothing more than me saying the same shit to different Phantom Thieves over the course of a week to get them back on my side, Marugi returns to ask me to give up my murderous ways and choose a happier, more peaceful life. If I still feel like killing after a month of thinking it over, we'll have no choice but to fight. Anyways, after a whole month of sleeping and not thinking about it at all, I tell him that this is the only life I know and I'd rather go out like a real one. With no other options, there's no choice but to fight. Peace versus violence. Kindness versus wrath. Maruki versus Sonic the Hog. And the final fight was a breeze. In his first phase, Maruki has a few gimmicks to slow me down, like hindering my ability to use magic attacks. But the Baton Pass reigns supreme here, and Azathoth is little more than an annoyance. The second stage is even easier as Maruki takes way more damage and can't block any attacks. It only takes a few turns to kill him. With the third and fourth stages being scripted, the fight is over. Maruki and the Way of Peace are defeated, and the Phantom Thieves' reign of terror begins. And it's all thanks to a little old game-breaking persona that cost me six real-life dollars. So just how fast did I beat Persona 5 Royal with Izanagi no Okami Pikuro? The final fight with Maruki ended at 19 hours and 1 minute, but with all the extra bullshit like Valentine's Day and saying goodbye to my friends, the official game time clocks in at 19 hours, 32 minutes. So what did we learn? Two things. One, 
This game is long as fuck. If the world record speedrun time of this game is shorter than the entire Death Note anime back to back, there's an issue. And two, if you want to beat this game without even having a brain, all you need to do is give Atlas even more of your money. If you enjoyed the complete lie I just described, please consider leaving a like. And if you want to see more challenge runs like this, subscribe to the channel and never miss another video where I meme my way through a video game. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. I just made